Around the world, climate activists have attacked works of art. For them, the reason is clear. What is worth more, art or life? All I would say is, don't ever do that to my art. Goodbye. Vandalizing art doesn't protect the climate. Some say the attacks go too far, but they do make headlines, and with that bring awareness. So do these attacks help the climate cause, or are they just vandalism? In any case, I wouldn't say it's an expression of love. No painting was damaged, but the impact was huge. So in that respect, kudos to the activists. We won't just lose our livelihoods in the climate crisis, but our culture too. When it comes to fighting for a cause, can you go too far? And why is art so often targeted? To better understand this civil disobedience, we take a look at its historical precedence and ask why it is often women who have been willing to break the rules to achieve change. For Pussy Riot, civil disobedience, political protest, and art are inseparable. The Russian feminist punk band are known for their powerful and often provocative performances. Their current mission is to protest against Russian President Vladimir Putin and his war in Ukraine. This drives us to give these concerts and to support Ukraine. We cannot just go out from this reality because we are from Russia. Pussy Riot first came to international attention with a performance in Moscow's main cathedral in 2012. Virgin Mary, Mother of God, banish Putin, they screamed in their punk prayer. It led to outrage in religious circles. The Kremlin decided to make an example of the three singers. They were sentenced to two years in a penal colony. In 2022, Maria Alyokina escaped from house arrest and Russia by disguising herself as a courier. On tour in Europe, Pussy Riot talked about their lives, reality in Russia, and expressed their contempt for Putin. We do not exclude activism from art, so we don't do just art. We do political actions and political art. And we believe that art should be political. It should be. It should serve uh, the society as a reflection of this, the uh, situation, political situation. Art as activism is one thing, but what about throwing mashed potatoes at a Claude Monet painting? Is it acceptable to target artworks for a cause, as these last generation activists did? People are starving. People are freezing. People are dying. We're in a climate catastrophe. The climate crisis won't leave any of our social spheres intact, including culture. We don't just do this in museums, but they are one of the places where protests should be talked about. If wars continue to take hold here in Europe due to a shortage of resources, there simply won't be time to engage with art and culture. Ortrud Westheide, the head of the Barberini Museum in Potsdam, does not necessarily agree with the climate activists' approach. It really was violence against art, and art should invite dialogue. Such a violation of boundaries is destructive. But it also attracts attention. Just over a hundred years ago, the suffragettes also targeted art in their fight for votes for women. In 1914, Mary Richardson slashed the Rokeby Venus by Velázquez. It was one of 14 attacks on artworks by the movement. Suffragettes also chained themselves to railings in protest. While in the U.S., the activists tended to seek debate. In England, they were more radical. They smashed windows, sent letter bombs. 
and some were even prepared to die for their cause. Such as Emily Davison, who threw herself in front of the King's Horse at the Epsom Derby in 1913. She died four days later. Fighting for a cause, no matter the cost. Looking back in history, you can see what helped set the ball rolling and what might have been a step backward. And accordingly, we've decided not to destroy or deliberately break any artworks. And we decided no people or bystanders should be involved, that no one should ever be hurt. Climate activists tend to agree that there should be no destruction, no hurting of people, just maximum media coverage. But does it help their cause to throw flour at a car painted by Andy Warhol? Will such actions change people's minds or just lead to head shaking? As an activist from the global south, I feel that actions like that take away the focus from the actual problem. And the problem is the Global South is already experiencing the climate crisis. Ina Maria Shikongo is a fashion designer and climate activist from Namibia. She uses recycled materials for her designs and for political actions. These protest banners against international energy giants, for example, are made from leftover fabric. I've always used art to say something, not just make art for the sake of saying it, because it doesn't make sense. You know, I believe that artists, we are communicators, you know, just like activists. The artist is one of the leading climate activists and a co-founder of Fridays for Future in her country, which has suffered from extreme drought for years. Activists are currently focusing their attention on a Canadian oil giant, Recon Africa, which plans to frack for oil and gas near the Okinvango Delta, which could become polluted and dry out even more. Chicago says the Global South, which is already suffering disproportionately from the climate crisis, continues to be exploited. Our lovely host Countries of the Global North have been shopping for, Afri for uh, gas in Africa, uh, using the energy crisis at the moment, the war in Ukraine and the energy poverty in Africa as a pretext to start uh, doing gas production in Africa. What that means is obviously opening up new gas fields, oil fields, and also putting the entire carbon budget at risk. are still growing the movement, but in a sense where we are more focused on climate education, um, uh, food uh, security, and just opening up the conversation. Because one thing that I've realized, especially through my interactions with the youth and the orphans, uh, is that we don't really have a platform where we can discuss how the climate is really affecting us. Climate change affects the whole world. The global south is most affected. And the most radical activism is taking place in the global north, which raises the question of which forms of protest are justified. Under the banner, climate action is not a crime, more than 1,000 artists and people from the industry expressed solidarity with the art attacks of the last generation. The renowned German art magazine Monopole even raised them to its cultural pantheon, listing them at number 19 of the 100 most influential people in the art world of 2022. But is this unwanted advertising for the museums? Sure, you could say this had the unwanted effect of museums having more visitors. But maybe attacking these institutions and their inertia wasn't so misplaced. It's no surprise the reaction has been to increase security. The Hamburg Kunsthalle decided not to increase security, although some works here could be targets. The director is happy to engage with activists. 
Ich wurde gefragt, wie ich zu den I've been asked how I felt about the attacks and I said I could well understand them and that I see the climate debate as highly important. Und dann entwickelte sich im Endeffekt so ein The activists contacted me and a dialogue developed. We're still talking. Wir sind noch im Gespräch. For the 2022 Futura exhibition, the Kunsthalle organized sustainability workshops with Fridays for Future. The posters were then used at a rally. Uns als Museum kann das eigentlich nur As a museum, we should be glad to be a platform for protests that want to achieve social progress. It seems reasonable to say museums should be on the pulse of the times and an open space for civil disobedience. The art institutions and market always portray themselves as being on the right side, as progressive. But in America, for example, the people on the boards of museums are the same people who in real life build devices for bugging dissidents and clear rainforests and create toxic waste. It's contradictory. Even New York's Metropolitan and Guggenheim Museums and the Paris Louvre have been accused of double standards. Major museums that have also shown Nan Golden's pieces. The photographer rose to prominence with her pictures from the queer New York underground. Intimate and honest snapshots of her friends. And her own life. In 2018, Golden took on the billionaire Sackler dynasty, worldwide the most important patron of art institutions. They have been immortalized with inscriptions and their own exhibition halls. But their reputation as donors has been tainted since their Purdue pharmaceutical company caused the biggest opioid scandal in the U.S. Their painkiller OxyContin drove hundreds of thousands into addiction and death. Golden, too, was an addict. The documentary All the Beauty and the Bloodshed shows her as a woman who, scarred by personal struggles, becomes a strong protester. We need to demand that the Met Museum, the Louvre, the Tate, refuse donations from the Sacklers and take down their name. The message is that tainted money should no longer fund art institutions. And it was heard. The Guggenheim and other museums have declined further funding from the Sacklers and removed their names. The campaign was Nan Golden's first success as an activist. Many artists, like Nan Golden, follow the money trail and take on corrupt patrons. There are always scandals. That goes hand in hand with what the last generation wants. They want change, but change only happens when institutions change. Bringing change to art institutions has also been part of the Guerrilla Girls' mission since the 1980s. In particular, they want to see more POC and female artists in museums and exhibitions. The group became known through illegal poster campaigns in New York, but to this day, no one knows who is behind the guerrilla masks. The group spreads its message everywhere and stands up for their peers with imagination and humor. Their posters will be on show in Hamburg in March 2023. Guerrilla Girls Pop Quiz. If February is Black History Month and March is Women's History Month, what happens the rest of the year? Discrimination. Their humor draws people in. And it is fun to then point your finger and say, that's true. What's going on? Why is 90% of the art on display by white men? It really makes you want to stand up too. These days, Guerrilla Girls are active worldwide and open to female collaborators. They have prompted museums and exhibition organizers to think about the representation of women in art. Which leads to a new question. Recently we've been busier than ever, and we've also been faced with kind of a huge dilemma. 
What do you do when the system you've spent your life attacking suddenly embraces you? That's a shift. That people who've stood up to institutions are now being invited and paid for their work by these institutions. But I don't think this detracts from the work, but rather attests to its beginning to work on a structural level. Brazilian activist Kai Sara also exposes structural tangles with her art. Her performance against the greed that exploits and destroys the rainforest is called asphyxia, suffocation. Art was the place I found for myself, where I can be heard, where I become visible, because art gives me this place of greater perception. With art, we can convey things more sensitively. The indigenous artist's home is the Amazon. Under Bolsonaro's government, the destruction of the rainforest was sped up. 18% of the rainforest is raised. Another 7% will cause the world's climate to tip. This would impact everyone. But most of all, the Amazon's indigenous peoples. I was born and grew up in a protected territory, the Alto Rio Negro. But for those whose land is not protected, it is very bad. They are exposed to violence and displacement. They have no right to their own land. So I feel the demarcation of indigenous lands as territories is one of the most important tasks. Kai Sara says it's not only the land of the indigenous people that's endangered, but also their culture. Until recently, they were living in balance with their natural environment. But that is changing, even if the global north still likes to exoticize them. I hope to see indigenous culture respected and people maintain their own cultural traditions and not try to fulfill the wishes of non-indigenous people. Through art activism and civil resistance, Kai Sara is championing indigenous rights and protecting the rainforest in a fight for survival. Why is it often women who step up and dedicate their lives to a greater cause? Greta Thunberg has become the face of the climate movement. She began calling for school strikes while still in school herself. She's known for speaking truth to power. We say no more blah, blah, blah. <laughs> We're not gonna let them get away anymore. Her so-called school strike for climate demonstrations gave rise to a new form of civil disobedience, sparking the worldwide Fridays for Future movement. Thunberg became the symbolic figure of a generation that sees its future betrayed by its parents and politics. The world is waking up, and change is coming, whether you like it or not. I don't think it's a coincidence that women have somehow become the faces of the current climate movements. They've always played an important role in civil resistance, but unfortunately they've not been seen as such. I don't want to say they've been erased from history since we're still talking about them, just much less than their male contemporaries who've been idolized. Innovative rebellions led by women can actually be traced back to ancient Greece. In Lysistrata, a comedy by Aristophanes, the women of Athens and Sparta joined forces to end a war waged by men. Their last resort is a sex strike. And it works. The men eventually make peace to end the Peloponnesian War. This parable about women's power against male warmongering is a reoccurring theme. In the Greek tragedy Antigone, the eponymous protagonist defies the ruler Creon after he refuses to bury her brother for being a traitor to the country. Swiss director Milo Rao transposes the play to the present in the new production Antigone in the Amazon. The lead character, played by Kai Sara, resists the ruling system fighting for the rights of an indigenous and landless population. 
Então, para a gente sempre, todos os governos foram. To us, all governments have been like Creon. We've always had to fight to have our rights respected. Pussy Riot are also fighting against their Creon. Vladimir Putin, who is ignoring international law and waging a war of aggression against Ukraine. There isn't much protest in Russia these days. What there is, is often led by women. A lot of uh, women and mothers as well uh, that are protesting this war. Because, you know, it's, uh, the femini feminist issues are not that far from anti-war activism because uh, all these uh, narrative, militarism, it's all very um, machistic and uh, it's very male energy, like conquer the world and uh, um, occupation, everything. Their videos are a plea against this brutal macho militarism bringing suffering and death to so many civilians and soldiers alike. What can civil disobedience really accomplish, and how? Mahatma Gandhi, probably the most famous proponent of civil disobedience, led the Indian independence movement and consistently remained nonviolent. In 1930, the austere pacifist marched nearly 400 kilometers to the sea with his followers to symbolically harvest salt. Thousands of Indians followed in his footsteps and thereby violated the British salt monopoly. This spectacular nonviolent uprising is seen as the beginning of the end of British colonial rule. The practice of civil disobedience has been around for a long time, even though the term isn't that old. It's often associated with Henry David Thoreau, the American writer who refused to pay taxes in protest against slavery and the U.S. war against Mexico. It's a violation of the law, but a violation justified by moral principles. So not done for one's own benefit or self-enrichment, but precisely on the basis of principles that have to do with democracy, the rule of law and justice. Rosa Parks is another icon of civil resistance. She was arrested when she, a black woman, refused to give up her seat on the bus to a white person. Her defiance had a great impact. After a year-long bus strike by the African-American population, the law of racial segregation in buses and schools was found to be unconstitutional and repealed in the state of Alabama. It was an important victory and the beginning of the USA's civil rights movement under the leadership of Martin Luther King. The charismatic speaker defended Rosa Parks' refusal and promoted civil disobedience as a means of combating segregation in the southern states. The civil rights movement achieved its goals with the abolition of racial segregation and the right to vote for the South's black population. Different times, some might say. But aren't these precisely the role models of the more recent protest movements? Whether it's the anti-nuclear movement or Occupy Wall Street, it's all about nonviolent protest. But how does traffic obstruction fit into the picture? Road blockades are part of the standard toolbox for civil disobedience. Even Germany's federal constitutional court has recognized that something like blocking a highway falls under the freedom of assembly. This point has been a bit lost in the ongoing discussion, that assemblies and democratic protests will always have some risks and annoyances, but that's the price of democracy. A democracy should be able to withstand the various means of civil disobedience, especially when it's not just about local concerns, but global ones, like climate change. And yet, calls for harsher punishments are growing louder. In the UK, Extinction Rebellion's actions have already led to restrictions on the right to demonstrate. We need more incendiary speech, making it clear to people that we're in such deep trouble that something has to change. And something will change. Like Greta Thunberg said, change is coming whether you like it or not. But what actions will resonate with people? Do we need more radical means or more haunting images? Like those of the Ocean Rebellion, 
who point to the dying of fish and pollution of the oceans. Or those of the Red Rebel Brigade, demonstrating as silent witnesses to the climate catastrophe, like here in Berlin. We're allowed to demonstrate and we're protected by the state through the freedom of assembly. We're allowed to stand here at the Brandenburg Gate every day and protest against anything we don't like. In many countries, rebels can't do that. They're immediately arrested, killed or disappeared when they try to protect what's theirs. As is the case in Russia, where the members of Pussy Riot are not safe due to their radical and open criticism of the status quo. So is it not important that civil disobedience in all its different manifestations is tolerated in democracies? Do your own actions. They are important in Europe. They are important here also. Thank you. How far do you think civil disobedience should go? Let us know in the comments.